Hello and welcome to my podcast, Up Your Total Glow, your podcast for your body, mind and soul to support, guide and empower you to uncover your most glowing, healthiest and feel good version of you. I am super excited that you are here because if you ask me, there's nothing that looks and feels better. In today's episode, I'm speaking with the absolutely amazing Lisa Sugarman. Lisa is a renowned published author, columnist, counselor, storyteller, mental advocate, and an amazing woman. She believes that there is strength and healing to be found within our shared experiences, which is why she is committed to sharing her story of life after loss. In this beautiful interview, of course, she shares her story. She speaks also about why it is okay to not be okay. She tells us how to help someone who is suicidal and why it is important to sit in your grief. She also talks about why it is valuable and very cathartic to talk about someone you have lost. This is a beautiful interview and a must listen for you if you want to make our world a healthier, happier place and also your personal world. Please enjoy. Here she is, the amazing Lisa Sugarman. Hello and welcome, Lisa. I am so excited to have you here today. How are you? I'm well. I'm so excited to be here. Let's dive into this conversation. I've been really looking forward to this. So maybe to head it off, could you please introduce yourself? Who is Lisa Sugarman? <laughs> These days, it feels like I'm a lot of different things, but it, it all focuses around kind of the same, the same hub of Uh, someone who just cares really deeply about mental health and wellness, overall mental health and wellness. Um, I'm a mom, first and foremost. I have two grown daughters, uh, 23 and 26. Uh, I've been married to the same wonderful guy for well over 30 years. We've been together since we were 17 years old. Yeah. <laughs> the years are adding up, but it feels, it's so funny. It just feels like we're kind of We're kind of going backwards, doing kind of a Benjamin Button and, you know, getting more youthful the longer we're together. So that's that's a beautiful that's a beautiful thing. We're here in Boston in the U.S. Um, I live right just right outside of Boston, about 15 miles uh, this is where I grew up. It's where my husband grew up and where we, we just raised our family and planted our roots. And so I, I've been a lot of different things, but but. And it's, it's varied over the years, but it's all related back to creating content that I put out into the world in lots of different forms. Um, I'm a writer by trade. I, I've written a bunch of parenting books. Uh, they're, they're all over and have been doing that for, for a lot of years and made the transition from the parenting space into the mental health space quite by accident. I, I know you and I talked at length when, when we first met uh, last month about my story. And it's a little bit unusual. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a mental health advocate. I'm a crisis counselor. I'm a storyteller now. And I am all those things now because I learned that 35 years after my father passed away, he had actually taken his life. So I've, I've lost my father twice now in my life. When I was 10 years old, he passed away. And the narrative that I was given was that he had had a heart attack. And that was not the truth. I didn't find out the truth until I was 45 years old and quite by accident and have really just gone from being completely blown apart in almost every way that I could explain to being in a place where I've, I've somehow put those pieces back together in a way that allows me to help other people navigate the same path or a similar path to the one that, that I've taken kind of through that grief and that loss and 
and all those those unanswered questions. And so that's that's what I spend my time doing is creating content and and videos and um, putting you know lots of hopefully um, support and resources out into the world that'll help people have a better quality of, of mental health. We so need your content and your support. I think you're absolutely amazing. And it feels that your job, what you're doing, all the hats that you are wearing and putting it all together, it becomes more and more important. I feel, yes, we are talking more about mental health now and maybe also more people dare to maybe, just maybe, dare to say they are not feeling so well. But I also think with what happened over the last few years, this has yeah, exploded mm -hmm. in a negative way how we are feeling, how we are um, connecting to others, if we are able to connect to others. And all of this is not very helpful yeah, for our mental health, I really feel we need tools to make sure we we can stay positive and focused and aligned with our true selves. So I really, really, yeah, love what you do and I think it is so, so important. So can you maybe explain a little bit more what you you know like you said you lost your father twice first mm -hmm. you were told the story he died of a heart attack and I'm sure mm -hmm. at 10 years old this is like horrible of course mm -hmm. you need your father um and then you said by accident at the age of 45 you learn oh actually I was lied to um or this is you know how I would feel maybe this it didn't feel to you like this but I would feel like well, well you lied to me I understand why but you know it wasn't the truth and can, can you dive a little bit into those emotions because I guess your family just wanted to protect you totally under understandable but is this really protecting us how can we navigate if we know someone is really unwell, how do we talk about it? How do we address this? I really want to pick your brain. And these are lots of questions. Please start where you want yeah. to start. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. All, all of these questions are such relevant and important questions. And they're questions that we, be, we need to be asking each other. And more importantly, we need to be able to be vulnerable enough to answer those questions. So in, in my case, I'll, I'll go back and I'll give you some context. So I'm an only child. My family unit when I was a little girl was very, very close. My parents had an absolutely beautiful marriage. My parents met and were married within six months. They fell madly in love with each other. They were together for 18 years. There were no signs whatsoever that my father was struggling. My father was an incredibly driven, kind, loving very devoted man. He was very hands-on in as much as you could be hands-on with a, you know, a full-time job. He drove into the city every day, he commuted. So, you know, he, he was out of the house from morning until typical, you know, typical nine to five hours. But when he was home, he was there and he was present and he was with me and he was joyful and he took such pleasure in life. I, he, I mean, I, I credit everything that I love about nature and movement and the outdoors to my father. That was who he was and where he loved to be. And, and I love that because of him. And so there was nothing that was presenting in any way that, that was alarming to my mother. I mean, I was a 10 year old kid, so what did I really know? But my mother knew nothing. And even though he did, like I said, he, you know, he was busy. He did have a full-time job and he also had another job that was even more challenging than his full-time job, which was to take care of his, his family had a lot of real estate interests in the Boston area. That was his parents' business. And when my grandfather passed away, my father took over the management of all of these buildings. And, and that was, that was a lot. It was, it was a lot with a young family and with, a separate full-time 
career, but my father did it and he did it extremely well, but it was a lot of pressure. And my father's family was, it, look, there's no other way for me to say this, but my, my father's family was a very difficult family to be a part of. Um, what surfaced after he died was that there was a tremendous amount of anger and mental illness in the family. My father was very different than his siblings, than his parents. Um, and I mean, my father's nickname was the unwanted. That's what my grandmother called my father. So that gives you just a little bit of insight into the life he had when he was young. So he had all of this pressure on him. And toward the very, very end of his life, probably the last several months of his life, that was the only thing that my mother saw that was different. She saw that he was overwhelmed, that he was maybe not withdrawing in what you would think a typical withdrawing um, picture would look like, but he was different. And then before, uh, before we knew it, he was gone. And he actually did tell my mother that he was going to see a therapist maybe twice before he passed away, but it was, it was either the wrong fit or too little too late or whatever the case was. It didn't, it didn't work. So my mother in that moment when my father passed away, it was so sudden and so unexpected. And my mother was, was 40, was fairly young. Mental illness was completely different than it is now. Talking about it, dealing with it, navigating it. There weren't the tools. There was so much stigma yeah. and, and people just weren't talking about it. So she finds out that he's taken his life and now she's got to think about me. And in that moment, she made that decision that knowing he had died was enough. And that that would be, if that didn't derail me, it certainly would derail me to find out that he had made the decision to leave. Because we didn't, we didn't think about mental illness in the same way that we do now. People thought about it in, in more selfish terms. Like why, why couldn't he have thought of his daughter or his wife or his family or his career, whatever, whatever the case, but we, we don't, we didn't know then what we know now that it was an illness and that that mental illness is so deceiving and it's so calculating and contaminating. And Can I just say something because I, yes. I feel we still don't know enough. I mean, we know so much more than back then, but I still feel unless you have somewhere, some, somehow been in contact with someone who is truly suffering, it's mm -hmm. so hard to truly understand. Like so often... <laughs> And I had this myself. So just the thought, like my husband has been struggling with mental illness for years and years and years. And first of all, it took me such a long time to understand what's actually going on. And then um, also I could feel inside of me this, <laughs> this thought, this wanting of, well, just get your act together. I don't get it. I mean, just, you know, and... Mm -hmm. I know this feels really horrible saying it, but no, not at I all. too had to learn, like, it, it's not that easy. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it, he can't get his act together. And this is what, what I, what, why I interrupted, because I think you're so spot on, but I also think it's still so misunderstood. Like, when you really mm -hmm. um, have depression or anxiety or wh whatever it is, it is... <laughs> leading your life like it, it's not that easy to to get a hand on, on it or to just talk yourself out of it it's it's different right. it's I, I I like to compare it with cancer and I hope this is not I, I don't want to mean anything bad to anyone but we all mm -hmm. understand how very detrimental cancer is and we mm -hmm. all have a lot of um sympathy for someone who has cancer and I really feel it is the same severity I mean it's different but yeah so it's, I, it's an it's an illness I, yeah. I have a feeling I know what you're trying to say because yeah. I do say this quite often and I often use cancer or heart disease or any other kind of an illness or an accident or something that is 
in theory, beyond our control. You would yeah. never condemn someone or but more understood. Be, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying. And that's, that's the case, but the way I've come to understand it, because here's the thing for me personally, my whole belief system changed when yeah. I was a little girl, the year before my father passed away, my cousin who lived right up the road, my first cousin, we were together every week of my life. My mother's older sister, his, her son, he took his life. I was eight. He was 18. I was nine at the time. My parents were very honest with me in a very age appropriate way, in the way that they said he had taken his own life. He was, you know, his his brain was sick. It didn't function the way other people's brains function. And my parents were very forward thinking in that way. And I, I remember from that moment believing that so that was my first experience with suicide. And my first inclination was That's so damn selfish. How, why, why wasn't he thinking of his mom or his dad or his brother or his sister or any of us or my grand, our grandparents and, and I carried that belief system. No one gave it to me. I internalized that myself. Didn't talk about it. Just thought that way until I was a grown adult, until my own father's suicide became, became my truth. Yeah. And it, it took an awful lot for me to recognize that, you know, if you take off the word mental, when you say mental illness, it's an illness yeah, like any other illness. And it took me a very long time. But once I connected those dots, it was, that was instantaneous. Yeah, and it, ha it it hasn't changed, but I understand what you're saying. It's um, it's very difficult because you kind of want to shake someone and say, "Hey, come exactly. on, come yeah. on, it's not that bad. Pop pop out of it," and and that it just doesn't work that way. No, you can't yeah. pop someone yeah. out of cancer either. No, or heart exactly. Disease. exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, what happened then? I mean, yes, we totally understand like why you're mother decided um, not to tell you but then when you found out by accident how did this change everything that you knew really about your father I guess I mean not that he was loving and amazing and all of these things but I do think you probably went through everything again in your past and it changed just how you thought about everything so can you talk us a little bit through this yeah Sure. I, you know, it really, I, I say it the same way every time anyone asks me, because I really feel like it's the only way that people can really truly understand without understanding. It blew me apart. Yeah. It, it blew me to pieces. Yeah. I was leading a, a very much a double life for years. And anyone who's close to me, who was close to me during that time, friends, even, even extended family, they had no idea. Absolutely no idea because in an outward facing way, I was raising my young children who were teenagers at the time. I was working full time. I was taking care of my home. I had my friendships. We socialized, we skied every weekend. I mean, I was living my life like nothing had ever happened. And on the inside, when I would come home at night and I would close the bedroom door, I would fall to pieces and I would cry myself to sleep. I would wake up crying. My husband was there for me every minute of every day of all of those years, letting me do whatever I needed to do to navigate that. And it was very difficult because, you know, this, this person who, remember my father was immortalized to me as this larger than life hero, best friend, um, protector, all the things that a father would be. And he was all those things to me. And whether I wanted it to or not, his suicide changed a lot of that for me for a very long time. Yeah. And I was, I was, I'll tell you the one thing that I was very, very angry about and I still, to this day, I'm kind of waiting for it to happen. It's been 10 years and I'm 
still waiting for it to happen where I get angry with him for leaving me. I've never found myself consciously angry that my father left me. I was absolutely bullshit for years that my father left my mother in that situation. That she was working part-time at a nursing home as a secretary. She hadn't gotten a college degree because her family, when she was young, really needed everyone to contribute and everyone worked and contributed to the family. My mother was brilliant, still is, such a such a lover of, of academics and school, but she gave up an opportunity to go to college to help her family. And so there she was, 40 years old, a widow with a 10-year-old child and a part-time job. And, and it just crushed me when I went back over everything that had happened. I mean, my mother was 75 when I found this out. I was 45. So she had lived her life already, mm -hmm. but I went back and reprocessed all of it thinking, oh my God, not only did you do all this alone and you raised me alone and my grandmother came to live with us. So she had three of us in the house and she was taking care of everyone. And now I'm thinking, God, and you, you knew that dad had taken his life and never spoke a word about it to a single soul. Mm -hmm. Never, never told a single soul, not her siblings, not her mother um no one wow and and that that devastated me for a very long time I still when I think about it when I get really in my head about it I, it's it's very difficult mm -hmm. but the one the one thing that I I have never felt and I I know myself and I I know I will never feel um angry or bitter or or resentful in any way of my mother not telling me that truth yeah I, I can I, feel that I, so much mm. I am I am so grateful to her, Ruth, mm. in every way for shielding me from that because I know I know what uh, that was like. I remember that moment when I found out he was gone. Mm. Like I remember it like it was this morning, and I just I cannot imagine layering a suicide on top of yeah learning that he was gone. Yeah, and what that would have done to me. And my mother just had that instinct, and I think it was the right instinct. And I'm I'm very very grateful that she did what she did because I don't know if I would have made it had I known. Beautiful. And um, have you been able to speak to your mom about it now? Now that you mm. know. Yeah. In fact, um, my mother, my mother is my best friend in the world. We talk up a hundred times. So beautiful. Day. She lives in Florida. We live here in Boston. She spends the summers with us. She's She's been with the same wonderful man who she met the year my husband and I got married. So they've been together as long as my husband and I have been married. So it's been over 30 years. He's a grandfather to my children. He's like a father to me. And so we we spend an awful lot of time with them. And when this all came out, um, she was she was very upset that it came out only because she knew the pain that it would cause me. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was a hard place to be. It was a hard position to be. And I, I was grateful that I knew so that she didn't have to shoulder it all alone. Yeah. But of course it, it was devastating in all the ways you would imagine. And so we talked about it. I mean, she and I talked about it for years before I told anyone, my husband knew, but before our kids knew, And then ultimately, after a few years of kind of just processing and trying to just live with it for a little bit, I decided that the girls were old enough. I, they needed to know. I think I yeah. think it's very important that everyone needs to know if there is that ability to know where you yeah. come from and what that genetic cocktail looks like, because yeah. we all have it. Yeah. And we, we, we don't know how it translates to each one of us. And if something like that ran in their bloodline, they deserve to know so that someday if something were to show up or, or catch them by surprise, they, they would feel like they could talk about it. And, yeah. and it was after talking about it with them that I started, that's when I started talking about it with everyone. My mother and I talk about it um, daily, every day. Beautiful. And I love how, you then truly decided to 
once you were able to process it and talked it through with your mom, I guess also to make sure that it's okay that you talk about it now that you now truly empower others through this because I do think and you like you said you want your girls to you know be empowered and know or be aware of what could be there we never know but also mm -hmm. then you probably want their boyfriends or their partners or their husbands mm -hmm. um so it goes further and further and this is where I think storytelling is just so so powerful now you have this very painful story that you have decided to tell to help others so what can we do Lisa how can we truly help others who are suffering who are in pain it's so hard because still I feel so many just withdraw how how can we tell the signs what can we truly do I think we do what you and I are doing right now. We mm. have these conversations. We allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We share our truth. We express those fears and those sadnesses and those, those feelings of grief and, and loss. And we do that so that other people can feel safe in doing that we create safe spaces you know there's yeah. look people have been talking and and storytelling since the beginning of time since before we had any of the resources that we have now i mean yeah. that's how it started that's how we communicated with each other and i feel like we got away from that somehow and now i feel like maybe we're we're coming back to our our roots collectively as a society and 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 recognizing that the real power is right in here. The power yeah. is is in communicating what we each go through because similar, similar, I used to talk about it in, in the context of parenthood, how when you have your children and I know mothers or fathers or caregivers, when you're in the thick of raising your kids, it's so isolating and you feel like you're the only one who's being kind of crushed under the weight of either the stress or the anxiety yeah. or the expectations. It's a lot like that with mental illness. It's yeah. very much like that with mental illness. People all around us, everyone you see has something. Everyone you see has had a loss of some kind, yeah. whether it be a relationship or a job or a, God, you know, a, a partner or something tragic like a death in their life. Like if if you haven't met someone in life who has experienced some kind of loss, I don't know who that person could possibly be because yeah. we've all experienced it. And yet we all feel so completely isolated in our own minds and in our own hearts about it. And so when we start talking about it and putting it out in the mainstream, we change that narrative and we say, it is safe. To have these conversations it is okay to be sad or to grieve as long as you need to do that mm -hmm. and as deeply as you need to feel that you know when we give ourselves permission to 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 speak about the things that we guard so closely yeah well when i do that then you see me do that yeah and you say I, I could probably do that too. And then the person who hears you says the same thing. And it's really just, it's really, I think, just a big domino effect. And the more that we do it, the more mainstream and accepted it becomes. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think all of what you said is so powerful, truly. In the end, I mean, we are one. I, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but it is so no, not true. At all. And I think this is what makes it so hard because our society has us more and more being isolated, just the way everything mm. has become more automated. Like we are dating online now, we are working online, not all the time, mm. but more and more we're going shopping online, um, which is, it's really practical, but we also have to be mindful of that we truly, truly need the connection 
And mm -hmm. online connection is just not the same. It's not the same. We can't touch, no. we can't smell. Um, it doesn't exchange the same hard waves or vibrations or whatever you want to call it. So I do think it is super, super important. And like you said, going back to our roots, which was storytelling, and I feel we are more and more trying to do that, maybe out of despair because everything has started to become so isolated and automated. Also in my world, in my world of nutrition and health coaching, like, you know, I work a lot with Ayurveda, which is a science that is over 6,000 years old. And what they say we now just discover, you know, it's important to go with the circadian rhythms. It is important to, you know, really look after your gut health, your digestive system, mm -hmm. all of these things that we now like discover, oh, wow, um, they knew back then. So I feel it's the mm -hmm. same, different, of course, but kind of the same as storytelling this is how we truly learn this is how we remember that you know we are not meant to be isolated because actually we all are the same we all know how it feels when we have a truly bad day okay of course we we might not be a hundred percent able to relate to what it feels to be fully depressed or anxious but we all know a little bit those feelings and mm -hmm. um yeah does that make sense to you any thoughts to absolutely it? yeah beautiful yeah yeah i i think that we've gotten away from the simple things and that's where we've gotten into trouble we've over complicated things and we've yeah. forgotten that when when we just use our instincts and we do the things that we were created to do, born to do, um, that's hardwired into our DNA to do, Yeah, that those are the things that will sustain us. And this is one of the most basic things that any of us can do is to connect with one another. And, you know, I mean, I, I can't speak enough, and I'm, I have a feeling that you agree, I cannot speak enough to the value and the importance of community. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, it's, it's what, it's what we all crave it's what we all need it's it's what it's it's what propels us forward knowing yeah. that we have people behind us and people with us standing beside us and you know those are the those are the people that you know that we have to offload a lot of what we carry we're not supposed to carry it all and i'm speaking now about kind of you know the emotional baggage that we all carry we're not supposed to carry it all by ourselves but you know we live in a society in a world where the expectation has been so muddled it's it's now all about or at least it has been all about how how much can you take on yeah how how much can you handle yeah go you faster go, go harder go you faster, have to do it harder. all alone. Yeah. exactly exactly yeah. and and unfortunately we've seen we've seen the catastrophic result yes. of of doing that people are burning out people are getting depressed people are taking their lives people are becoming overwhelmed people can't cope and and it's because we're not designed that way yeah you know there's our our life is supposed to ebb and flow we are supposed to you know we're supposed to laugh we're supposed to cry we're supposed to work we're supposed to rest and yet we don't incorporate that into our lives we don't prioritize each of those things yeah as equally important and so you know I, th I think that the world that we're living in right now right this minute is beginning to embrace that again yeah. it's beginning to get back to a place of of more simplicity and and self-care and listening to our bodies and our minds and what we need and and you know i think we're doing that individually and then we're starting to kind of it's permeating the culture which i think ultimately is what will normalize it all mm, absolutely yeah and i love that you are such a huge help and empowerment in doing so and i also fully agree that you know it's one thing to say yes 
we all have to be vulnerable, but you know, mm. saying this is very different to actually telling your own story, you know, mm -hmm. being vulnerable. This is a total, mm -hmm. a total different situation. If you do this to someone, I think they really feel the space to open up. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, I feel so little and you're above me because you've got it all together. And, mm -mm. you know, my life is just shit. This is what's going on in the mind. Obviously, yeah. it's not yeah, for yeah. anyone like this. But then we have social media where there is Instagram. And I'm on Instagram too. Instagram is great. But Instagram mm -hmm. has also the side of everything is picture perfect. Yeah. And it's curated. It's, it's, all, is, it's all curated. Exactly. This is like 30 seconds way. or 60 yeah. seconds of a life. And I think... If someone is already so doubtful of themselves, it's more hurtful. It's not helping. So I really, really love that this other side is coming more <laughs> to be seen as well. And you're a great mm. part of this. Absolutely. So I know that you are a crisis counselor as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you do as a crisis counselor? Well, I, I work with an organization that's here. In, it's in the United States primarily, but about a year ago, they opened up a branch in Mexico, and it's called the Trevor Project. It is a nonprofit organization that provides crisis support and services to at-risk LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24. And so we, we would, yeah, we would we would take calls from anyone but our, our primary demographic who we're really trying to to aim our resources at is that 13 to 24 demographic but it's um it's just a beautiful organization they've been around for over 25 years i've been a lifeline counselor for them on their telephone hotline now for over a year and a half so they have a telephone hotline which is just the standard you pick up the telephone and you get someone on the other end and they also have a texting platform because a lot of people are just not yes. comfortable yes. being quite that connected to someone. It's better for them if they have a little bit of a barrier and yeah. you're not hearing someone's voice. So they also offer a texting platform as well. Right. And it's 24, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Uh, there's always someone there to pick up a call, always someone there to listen and to hold space. And we, we get calls from everyone in every possible situation you could imagine from youth who are struggling with sexuality and trying to come out or maybe have come out and they've lost their family support. Um, I, we get suicidal calls, people who are self-harming, people who have been in abusive situations, people who are experiencing homelessness or job insecurity, food insecurity. So it's really a range. And, and people, we have people who call just because they don't have anyone else in their life to yeah. call or to, to connect with and talk to. And so those are people who we call internally. We call them familiar voices because we do hear from them regularly because they just need to connect and, and we're just there to listen. So that's, you know, we're not there to solve someone's problem, yeah. but we're there to hold space and offer support and provide resources when we're able. And, and that's, that's how I spend um, quite a bit of my time. Mm. So beautiful. It really touches me deeply. It touched me deeply when you were speaking about all the suffering and this loneliness. And I also a hundred percent agree, you know, we can't solve anyone's problems, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we can hold the space. You know, we can remember that in essence, we are all love. I know again, sounds cliche, but that's true. Like, yeah, in essence true. we are all love so at least we can you know give a smile i don't know ask if some mm -hmm. something feels weird or just speak about ourselves maybe this opens up something else or write stories <laughs> like you mm -hmm. do which is amazing mm -hmm. amazing i've got one other question i know we're running um short in time but do you feel that men are more likely to not reach out? So they are more quiet. And then as a result of this, um, more prone to actually commit suicide, commit is not a nice word, um, to act on it? Actually, 
there have been a lot of studies done about the primary demographic of those who are taking their lives and mm -hmm. men in in that 50 to 60 year old bracket are the top yeah. are, are are in the top category yeah. of people taking their lives men will die by suicide almost four times yeah. as often as women so yeah there's i mean and i think it goes back to what we talked about earlier in terms of th that um the perspective that that image that yeah. uh, you know the optics of being the strong man being the provider men don't cry suck it up soldier on you know all of all of those clichés that we hear all the time and have heard for for generations that it's unfortunate that most men today have some degree of that hardwired into their DNA. It's what yeah. they're expected. You know, men, men can't explore their feminine side. Men can't be emotional or shouldn't be. Um, and, and it's unfortunate. And I think, again, that's beginning to change as well in some positive ways. But we have a long way to go yeah. before that kind of behavior becomes normalized and and you know, before men don't have to live with that, that stigma attached to them, where they they can only kind of be their masculine selves and nothing but that. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain way you would mm, talk to someone or ask someone when you can send something is off? Is it okay to ask are you okay? Or is that a triggering question? Are there better questions? I think it depends. It's it's situational for sure. Mm -hmm. So if let's let's just play a game for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's let's pretend that you've got a friend and that friend has been canceling plans, has been withdrawing, hasn't been answering your calls, um, is is clearly displaying signs that there is a problem mm -hmm. that could potentially be like a, a, a suicidal issue. The way to deal with that is to be as direct as possible. And I know mm -hmm. that it seems almost off-putting, but the way that we tell people, the way that we're educated to help people is to say, are you thinking of killing yourself? Yeah. And I know that it seems, it feels like it's, it, it's like it gets caught in your throat. Yeah. It's like, it feels there's a visceral reaction when you hear yourself say that because you're like, I can't possibly say that. If I yeah. say that, that's going to implant an idea. Someone's, someone's going to go ahead and do the thing because yeah. I said it. That is not the case at all. When someone is in crisis, any degree of crisis, of course, you can say to someone who you think may be having a bad day or they've lost their job and they're feeling depressed. Maybe you're not worried they're thinking of taking their life, but you're worried about them emotionally. Absolutely say, are you okay? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. If someone is very clearly in a different, more more escalated state, yeah. absolutely ask them directly, are you thinking of, of either killing yourself or harming yourself? Yeah. And what that does is validate what that person's going through. As yeah. scary as it may feel for us to ask the question, it's actually incredibly validating when you're hearing it and it's being asked to you because it's it says, you see that I'm in pain, you see that something's wrong, you see that I'm on the edge and you want to be there to help me. Yeah. So use that very, very direct language whenever you find yourself in that situation because it's been proven time and time again that asking that question directly will actually reduce the risk of having that person harm themselves. Mm, I love that. That's, mm. that's very, very empowering. Thank you so much for sharing this. And I do agree. Like my first instinct would also be, what do I do with saying this? You know, do I put mm -hmm. the thought into someone's mind or does the person then feel even lower because i might yeah. th think that so that's really really helpful when all that it does it actually really validates um what's going on instead of you know mm -hmm. 
making it weird again like you know yeah. oh i can't really address it because it's weird that's what we want to try and get rid of and let's mm -hmm. say hypothetically um the person you now know the person is um hurting themselves so mm -hmm what can you do there so can can you is there anything you suggest absolutely so here in the united states we have the 988 crisis lifeline number so when you push 988 you immediately get a life a trained lifeline counselor whose purpose is to de-escalate that person's behavior to support them to give them resources so I don't know whether or not you all have that kind of a service. Do you, do you have a crisis lifeline where you are? We must have a crisis lifeline. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. And in fact, on my website, I I have, I think there are something, something like 178 or 190 different countries in the world that have those numbers. I have well over a hundred of those numbers on my lifeline, I mean, on my resource page for people to access right. different parts of the world. So I'm, I'm sure that you do. That's the number to have them call, encourage mm -hmm. them to call. And if for whatever reason, they're, they don't have the capacity to call, but yeah. you know, they need help. And they're saying you call, we, we do third party calls often right. where mm -hmm. maybe a parent is calling for a child or a spouse is calling for their spouse or we or a friend is calling for a friend so in in that case that's all that you need to to be concerned with is doing that you don't have to solve the person's problem mm -hmm. you you're not expected to have all the answers all you're all you're offering to do is hold space for that person and to listen and to match them with someone who can help mm -hmm. and anyone anyone who answers any of those lifelines can be that person. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are in the world, your country or your region has got a number like that. Mm -hmm. It's always important. Have that number in, in your back pocket, put it in your phone, make a mental note, keep it mm -hmm. handy, know it, learn it. And that way, if you're ever in a situation like that, that's that's the bit of information that you're going to want to pass to that person. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's super helpful yet again. Okay, dear Lisa, where can we find your amazing stories? Where can we learn more about you? You already mentioned your website. Anything else yeah. where we can find your stories or yeah, where, how we yeah, can reach I mean, out? Yeah, the, the easiest place is always my website. It's um, it, it really is kind of that central hub of everything that I do. So all of my books are there and my columns are there. And my, I have a video series on YouTube called the Suicide Survivor Series. That gets funneled into my website. Um, all, all the interviews like this that I've done, articles that I've written, all the content that I produce is all there. But I'm also on... I'm on all the socials. I'm on Facebook at the Lisa Sugarman. I'm on Instagram at Lisa underscore Sugarman, um, YouTube at the Lisa Sugarman. So that's it. I'm, I'm around. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm very nomadic in that way. I'm all over the place, but my website at lisasugarman.com is the best place to get everything. Fantastic. And I will of course put all of these in the show notes. Oh, so You've given us so many insights, so much knowledge and wisdom, so much empowerment around mental health. But have you got three quick golden nuggets for us? So for my listeners who kind of just need short reminders or three short empowerments that you would suggest to them. I would say probably first and foremost is remember that every single one of us is just a work in progress. Yeah. And, always. And that's what we're, all that is always. what we're supposed to be. So that's, that I would say is number one. Number two is meet yourself exactly where you are mm -hmm. right now, wherever now is, whatever you're doing, whatever you may be struggling with, or you may be trying to work through just meet yourself where you are right now 
and let yourself feel what you need to feel while you're there. Don't rush it. Don't rush it away. That's the second. And the third I would say is just give yourself grace. Mm -hmm. Just we don't give ourselves enough grace. We feel like we have to keep moving all the time. We feel like we have to be all things to all people. And we tend to forget that we need to be all of those things to ourselves too. Mm -hmm. So I think more than anything else, give yourself grace. Beautiful. Three very empowering golden nuggets. Thank you so much, Lisa. You are absolutely amazing. I love the work that you do and I'm beyond grateful for what you do and that you took this time today to really empower my audience and in doing so, yeah, to make our world a healthier, happier place. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you. You are so welcome. I appreciate you right back. And thank you for gifting me the chance to have a conversation with you and with your whole community. Thank you. Keep glowing, Lisa. If you loved and enjoyed this episode, then please do me a favor and help me make our world a healthier, happier place. And you can do so by sharing this episode with just one other person who you believe would greatly benefit from listening to it. I know that you were born to live your best life, to feel absolutely amazing in your beautiful body, in your brilliant mind and in your boundless soul. So what are you still waiting for? Please make sure you do. I'm your biggest cheerleader. I believe in you. Keep glowing. Much love.